So, you've been bitten by the sawdust bug and purchased a new Norwood HD36 sawmill. Soon, you'll be loading your first log on the mill and slicing up your own lumber. The weather's beautiful and you're pulling off one perfect board after another. But first, there's work to be done. That sawmill isn't going to build itself and you've got a truckload of boxes full of parts to assemble. So, where do you start? How about box number one? The one that says, open first. Inside, on the top, is the manual. Hey, you're going to need that. It contains a list of parts, detailed instructions, pictures, and diagrams of the assembly process. The numbers in the squares tell you which box has a given part, and the numbers in the circles tell you which bag that part is in. The nuts and bolts for the first part are in box number two, and there's one part not in the instructions. Pretty cool, eh? Even makes me look good. Before you start to build the mill, I want to tell you that the instructions that came with it are very detailed, and most people can build the mill in a couple of days. Being somewhat mechanically challenged, it took me a little longer. If there's a way to put something on backwards or upside down, I'll find it. Just take your time and follow the instructions and enjoy putting the sawmill together. It'll be ready to go before you know it. Back to the nuts and bolts and the next tip. If you cut the bag open on the side instead of the top, the parts are easier to get to and they don't spill out every time you move the bag. The nuts are even easier to get to if you have a small box for them. But be sure to label the part number on the box. The cross bunks are the first part to assemble. It's easiest to lay everything out before you begin. You'll need a 9 16 socket wrench and a 9 16 combination wrench for this job. The instructions say you can put the stainless steel caps on at any time, but you might as well go ahead and do it now. These use shorter bolts, but the same flange nuts. The number 18A flange nuts, by the way, are the same as the number 18 flange nuts you've been using all along, and they're in the same bag. The stainless steel caps won't stain the boards the way iron does with some woods. There, now we're finished with step one. Next, we'll bolt the end of the track to the rails. It'll help to have some 6x6 blocking to rest the tracks on as you work. That gets it up off the ground a bit and makes it easier to install the bottom frame bolts later. Bolt a cross bunk in place, but just finger tight for now. Notice that the flanges on the ends overlap the flanges on the cross bunk. Both ends are the same, so it doesn't matter which one you use. You can, however, install them upside down, so make sure the square hole on the end goes toward the bottom. Again, just finger tight.
The front of the track bolts in the same way, but there's no cross bunk. The large round hole on the shim goes towards the top so that the bolt holes will line up. To keep the space the same, slip the metal shims in place between the front and the side rails. Again, just finger tight. Now you're ready to assemble the side rails. Slip the front cross bunk in place, again with the bottom flange facing toward the front. Line up the rails. and bolt the side plate in place. The center of the side plate lines up with the seam between the rails. Finish bolting the side rails in place. In every case, the cross bunks line up with the seams in the rails. Now that the mill is loosely bolted together, sight down it to see that it's square and level. You may need to adjust it a bit with shims and wedges before you tighten it. If the rails are a little bit offset, it helps to use a clamp to hold them in line while you tighten the bolts. As you tighten the side rails, start in the middle and work toward the ends. Do not install the bottom bolts just yet.
If you're assembling the trailer package, this is a good time to go ahead and skip to page 70 of the instruction manual and install the jack stands. A pneumatic wrench really speeds up the frame assembly. Notice the positions of the jack brackets. Insert the front bracket bolts from the inside and then secure them with nuts. Be sure to get them tight. Then slip the jack stand on the bracket and attach the bracket on the bolt with a second nut. The instructions show the center and rear jack stands attached the same way, but I recommend stud bolts as shown on page 74. This provides more attachment points for the clamps later. If you use stud bolts, by the way, you'll have to buy an extra 4 feet of quarter 20 all thread and cut it into 3 inch lengths. You can always assemble the mill with bolts for now and replace it with studs later. Then slip the jack onto the stand and pin it in place at the bottom. The center jack brackets install in the same way as the end brackets. Install the axle hangers. Since we don't want the axle parting ways with the sawmill at 60 miles an hour, let's follow the instructions and use the bronze colored grade 8 bolts and the nylon insert washers. For now, leave them just loose enough that you can adjust them when you attach the axle. Then attach the front axle hanger. Replace the six bottom frame bolts above the axle hangers with studs. These will hold the fender brackets and the carriage lock brackets in place.
go ahead and tighten these down with the wrench. Attach the fender brackets and the carriage lock bracket, just finger tight. Use the fenders to determine the exact spacing on the fender brackets and then tighten them down. You can lift the frame a little higher and get the 6x6 six six blocking out of the way, but be sure to keep it level. Now we'll skip to page 78 and install the tongue cross frame and receiver. Notice that the instructions call again for the grade 8 bolts. This is important since these bolts carry all of the stress of pulling the mill. Every one of these bolts has a sheer strength of 30,000 pounds. No wonder they're gold. Of course, they won't do you any good if the nuts come loose, so be sure to use the flanged nuts with the nylon inserts and tighten them well. The tongue receiver installation is pretty straightforward, but again, be sure to use the grade 8 bolts and the nylon insert nuts. Now you're ready to bolt the axle in place. Slip it under the mill, roughly lined up with the supports. Apply some grease to the bolt and bolt the front axle spring to the front hanger. When you tighten the bolt, be sure that it still allows the spring to pivot freely. The axle spring bolts to the rear hanger on a shackle. By the way, ignore those log clamps. They install later. Now install the bottom bolts along both sides of the frame. Be sure to use the number 32 carriage bolts, and it's okay to tighten these down as you go. To install the track, let's go back to page 48 of the manual. Start out with the short two-foot section, and use the L-shaped template to position the track on the frame.
a line of four foot section to the end of the previous section and use the template to locate the other end. Continue down the side of the frame using the two foot section at the far end. The easiest way to attach the track is to bolt down the two ends of each section, then go back and install the rest of the bolts, tightening them as you go. The ends of each piece of track should perfectly line up with the ones adjacent to it. Use the long template for the other side of the track so that it is perfectly parallel to the first side. Again, make sure that the ends of each piece of the track are perfectly matched. If you have tightened down all the track bolts, make a final check with the long track template. The four end stops simply clip into place and are held with a pin. This makes it easy to add extensions later. There are four clamp brackets. Two with the U-shaped openings go on one side of the frame, and the two with square openings go directly across from them on the other side. These simply bolt into place and can be easily moved to suit different lengths and positions of logs. Snug them down with a wrench, but they don't need to be super tight. Follow the instructions closely when assembling the clamps and the log stops. It isn't difficult, but there are a lot of parts to put together. One thing to watch for here is that the pieces were powder coated after the threads were tapped in the brackets, and you may need to clean them out with the included quarter inch 20 tap. Vice grips make a fair handle for the tap, but a regular tap handle would be much better. The set screw on the log stops lets you adjust the angle so that you get a perfectly square cut when you turn the log on the mill. The L handle lets you move the stops on the crossbar, and this gives you a lot of flexibility in handling different sizes and shapes of logs. The log stops have a roller that makes turning the logs by hand much easier and a cleat that pivots around and locks in place to hold the cant after it's been squared up.
the log stop bracket with the large rectangular hole and the log clamp bracket with the narrower opening go on opposite sides of the cross piece. The handle on the log stop holder faces the clamp. The clamp crossbar slides into the brackets. One end pins in place and the other end is secured with a bolt. Then install a clamp in the log rest. Install the clamp with the tooth facing toward the inside of the track. Adjust the set screw on the clamp so that it slides on the cross piece when you push on it at the bottom, but it locks in place when you push on the top. To install the log rest, lift the coupler handle, set the rest in place with the notched end facing away from the clamp. You should be able to lift the log stop in the bracket and it'll stay in place. Lift the handle and it'll drop down. Install the tongue. Be sure to secure the pin with the keeper. Attach the trailer hitch coupler and the safety chain. You can lift the frame with the jacks to make it easier to put the wheels on. I like to put a little grease on the bolts just to make it easier to get the wheels off later. Run the wiring according to page 86 of the manual. One wire runs up each side of the frame. There's plenty of wire, but rather than cutting it, I like to just tie it off. It helps to use a paper clip to open up the connector on the taillight when inserting the wire. And you can use the paper clip to make it easier to remove a wire when you've discovered you'd have inserted it in the wrong hole. Also, scrape off the powder coating from the frame where the bolts go through, and that'll give the lights a good ground. The light on the other side goes on the same way.
ground the white wire to the frame and you're ready to go.